Tis fine. I Tis assume I assume you were busy what with the holidays yeah. and all. Yeah. And um, it's the ultimate time killer. It yay. Is. It really is. Um cool. All right. I finished Slaughterhouse Five, but that's okay. Oh the nice. oh the book. Oh yes, the book. Ooh. Ooh. Great book. We should all read it. I wish I could read. Maybe not everybody should read it. But, uh, it's been a very fruitful, uh, long gap between the last time we recorded yeah, and this time. Yeah, I mean, like, you're probably just going to fucking destroy us with what you've been watching, but I, I, I got quite a bit to talk about. I'm not quite sure where to start with all this, but okay, we'll, well, can, we'll, can we'll I, see. Can I see the list? Oh, sure. And I've, I actually rewatched a couple of other things that I didn't put on there because I didn't really feel like talking about them, so that's not even all that I watched. Well, we yeah, we have a lot to talk about, and we also saw three billboards in there. So yeah, yeah. Well, out of all the things I've watched, I realized like, oh wait, I have the, le- the three billboards is the one I have the least to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, welcome back to the Hack Fraud uh-huh. Show, everybody. I realize it's a little bit after Christmas, but it's still the holiday season, yeah. and these movies don't have much to do with Christmas anyway, other no. than being set against the backdrop of Christmas and lights and trees and all yeah. that good stuff. It was an excuse for us to watch Eyes Wide Shut. What do you want from us? Or, Pretty much. And or, or how I like to phrase it, eyes sexually forced shut. <laughs> okay. That is one way well, one can put it. I also I also did really want to watch uh, Blast of Silence because I'd heard some things about it. It sounded interesting. It did sound yeah. interesting. Uh, it was It was fun. We'll, we'll get into that. Like anyway, yes. Eyes Wide Shut and Blast of Silence are the uh, topics of discussion today. But, of course, we're going to start with what we've been watching. And, who boy, do we have a lot to get into okay, with okay. this. Okay, okay. Tyler, uh, I want to talk about Full Metal Jacket. Oh, you? Okay, okay. okay. I want to talk about Full Metal Jacket. All right. All right. You, well, especially, I think, it's, I think it's awfully fitting because Kubrick. Yes, well, yes. So, I have another movie to go with our... Uh, Kubrick selection uh, mm-hmm. for this episode. I finally got around to watching his 1987 film Full Metal Jacket. What'd you think? It's interesting. You know, this, yeah. this movie, more maybe more so than any other Kubrick movie I've seen, is kind of a mixed bag. I think yeah. this, this is not anything new to say. Like, it is a very bifurcated movie, and mm-hmm. I think the first half is much, much more compelling than the second oh, half. Oh, yeah, well, that's like the, like the like plebeian opinion of it is, like, first half unbelievable, second half. Yeah, I well, there's interesting stuff in both. To be oh, sure, oh, oh, certainly and the first that first half is repetitive, but with a purpose, mm. I think, and it is think... it is very interesting. And it's weird because I think the structure of this movie is less like a two act kind of thing and more of a two separate three act stories. That's, yeah, that's that... about because like there's like you you get in the in the first half you get drill sergeant, private pile, right. insanity, right. And, and then the second one, it's like, God, I can't even remember. Like the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the second half is decidedly more of a mishmash. Yeah. Um, anyway, but that, that, the first half, yeah, it's like, it, it, it could be its own movie just mm-hmm. by itself about the dehumanization and the education of our military and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And as a document of that, that first half is really really compelling oh it's it's unbelievable like they, they just got a fucking drill sergeant <laughs> yeah and they just got him to scream at some actors right and like some of those lines are just utterly iconic and incredible <laughs> yes uh arlie ermy who would go on to voice the green army men in toy story um <laughs> oh were we not aware of this uh yeah it's okay pretty, well, he, he was also in spongebob <laughs> did not know that <laughs> Wait, uh, wait, what? I think there's like a fucking episode where they they did like a boating school like parody of Full Metal Jacket, pretty much. Uh, Ooh, maybe I'll watch that. Uh, That's, no. It's it's probably far less interesting than I said. Okay, uh, like most of SpongeBob. Anyway, yeah, you're not wrong. Um, yeah, so that yeah, that whole first half is really really interesting. Vincent D'Onofrio is great. Mm. He, I mean, doing a very obvious like becoming unhinged, and you know, some might say it's a little over the top, but I I did enjoy it. You know, and, like. Q- Kubrick does a lot of over the top, and like yeah. I, I think, like this, the sometimes just like sheer abstraction and surreality of it, kind of puts that through. Yeah, yeah, the, he kind of makes it work in in that way. That's mm-hmm. that's all good. When you get to the second half, I mean, there is a noticeable downshift into a like pretty good Vietnam movie, but yeah. it's like I think, especially by this point, this movie the movie came out in nineteen eighty seven, like. 
what was left to say about the Vietnam War specifically at yeah. this point. Uh, uh, like, we'd been through two whole decades, pretty much, yeah. of Hollywood breaking down and criticizing the Vietnam <laughs> War. And then I <laughs> and think then... Oliver Stone's platoon was kind of the capper on all of that. And uh, then Kubrick And then, yeah, along. Kubrick comes along and is like, I'm doing one too. It's like, yeah. well, okay, that's fine. I mean, to be fair, I haven't seen Platoon, so I, I don't neighbor, know neighbor what but... angle you know, each one is coming at it from. Mm. I, I do know Oliver Stone fought in the Vietnam War and yeah. Kubrick didn't. Yeah, well, and also, like, Kubrick's uh, vision is fairly straightforward as far as, like, Vietnam yes, media yes, yes, is yes. concerned. It's, it's a very straightforward, like, okay, yes, obviously this war was bad and, you mm-hmm. know, the soldiers are all... They've been yeah, trained they dehuman- to the point where they dehumanize the enemy. Yeah, and, and like, they, like, sh- they, like, treat the locals terribly yes. to, like, a point that, like... The, like, the very idea of seeing one of them as human causes some giant, like, slow motion sequence right. in, like, a firefight. Yes. Uh, but I will say, that, like, final sequence where they're going after the sniper in the building, that's an incredibly constructed sequence. Mm. Like, that's where mm. you really get Kubrick, like, turning on the third heat and just yeah. going, and you're like, oh, holy shit, and then the movie's over. But, uh, you know, as far as just walloping you right at the end there there's really no comparison to that yeah well this i kind of relate this i think this movie is like the best example of this because like i remember i was talking to reed about this earlier about like how kubrick relates to like what we deemed as like the fassbender wall uh-huh. when we watched Werner fassbender's films a while back whereas like kubrick will like get to a point where the ideas just kind of start to run dry, uh-huh. and it's just like then it's just him kind of engaging in, in filmic discourse. Yeah, and like in the, in the first half, like ideas like one after the other like are thrown at you, and like right. what repetition that repetition does have a point. Yeah, and like clearly. and like there's a ramping up of dehumanization. Right. Almost. Whereas in the second, we get to that ending where the drill sergeant is killed. Mm. And then the movie just becomes kind of meandering. It doesn't really have much of a clear ideology outside of like what we've already seen with a bunch of yeah. Vietnam movies. Like the visual style kind of becomes more standard. Yeah. Well, with, there, with the exception of the ending, which gets really super stylized well, and wonderful. There is still some good stuff sandwiched in mm-hmm. there. I do also really love that sequence where like they're filming them with the like the handheld camera, like yeah. all the soldiers kind of giving their account of the war and like why they're there and all that stuff that's all interesting yeah to see I, all those. I, I adore the exchange why do you have born to kill and a peace sign on your helmet <laughs> right yeah so there's all good stuff in there it's it's a super interesting movie oh yeah it is like one of it is in the vietnam canon for a reason yeah that's full metal jacket i would never discourage anyone from watching it oh no i, I think I, I as much as like we can I, I think like the whole thing is worth watching yeah yeah, yeah, yeah for mm-hmm. sure it's not like I would I wouldn't say like turn it off when you get to the second. Oh half. no, I wouldn't there's, say that. There's either. a lot of stuff to be mined there. Do you want me to keep going with these or? Uh... Mm-hmm. Um, well, that kind of depends. Like what what else you want to talk about? Uh, I'll kind of rattle these off. Yeah. Uh, one at a time. We don't have to go in depth on all of them. I rewatched uh, Noah Baumbach's The Squid and the Whale. Uh, still think that's his best movie. Okay. I've had forgotten how much of that movie you just spend cringing, like in a very intentional yeah, way. Yeah. Like Baumbach is very clearly just. Oh, man. Like, you mm-hmm. just watch the movie and you see what these people are doing and what they're doing to each other and you're in the choices they're making and you're just like, oh, oh why, why? Why would you do such a thing to a human being? Uh, yeah. But that, that's a great movie and it's like 81 minutes long. And yeah, it, I have... I have no reason to s- not to see that movie outside of, like, my own, like, artistic <laughs> musings. Yeah, no, it's it's good. It's I mean, it, it can feel... A little like indie land occasionally but like the, mm-hmm. the characters are super well drawn and the, the way it's shot it really works it's like okay. all kind of handheld super 16 but it was shot by um robert yeoman who Ooh. shot all almost all of wes anderson's movies Ooh. so so yeah hmm. it, it's good interesting that's good stuff there uh let's see i closed out uh the filmography of paul thomas anderson which i've been meaning to do for a little while oh, wow. minus phantom thread which i still yeah which we see. I don't know when the fuck it comes to Columbus. I don't either. Uh, I imagine I will probably see it in LA before I see it here. Uh, before, it, before it ever gets here. Anyway, I watched his first movie, Heart 8, uh, which is actually very good. It, oh, interesting. It, it, it is, uh, I mean, it's it's a little light. Not, I, not How light, long is but it? it's an hour 45. Interesting. So it's very doable. It's, it's 
lighter mm. certainly than like boogie nights uh it's, <laughs> it's hard not hard not to be but there there is a lot of uh you know compelling stuff in there right off the bat you can see this is a guy with a vision like the way mm. it's shot is still super interesting like it's it's all there like the seeds of all the stuff that would flower in Boogie Nights is all mm, right there. So, so, you, so you, you would relate it to sort of like proto Scorsese, sort of like Boogie Nights mode yeah, of Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it, you can see the kind of proto Scorsese, yeah, kind of stuff. But also like his fashion, his fascination with like surrogate families is already there. Uh, the the lead uh, parts are played by um, Philip Baker Hall and John C. Riley, and they kind of form sort of a surrogate father-son relationship uh, mm. that is actually very convincing and very very poignant and like right around the halfway mark like the movie really just kind of there's a scene where you just you, I, you just can't take your I couldn't take my eyes off the screen it, it's fascinating that's a really really good movie and it is uh, yeah. somewhat underlooked just because of like all the circumstances that movie had a very troubled production just because mm. of the way it was financed and the way it was released and the way all the stuff that went on Paul Thomas Anderson was a very kind of headstrong young filmmaker yes. at this time. And uh, uh, you can read all up all, all about that. I'm not going to get into it too Yeah, deeply, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, uh, that's a very good movie. Interesting. Uh, not a very good movie is his third movie, <laughs> uh, Magnolia, which Ooh. I would call, like, I, without hesitation, I would say is his life aquatic. Not, not just in mm. the fact that I don't like it, but also that... Like, this movie was coming on the heels of Boogie Nights, which was a big hit, got him yeah. lots of acclaim and attention, so he got carte blanche from New Line Cinema to basically just do whatever he wanted. And, uh, and he made Magnolia. He made Magnolia, <laughs> which is three hours long and sprawling and just a big old like, Robert altman -y ensemble piece about all these different characters, many of whom like just never really connect in any meaningful mm. way. It's all just kind of loose and sprawling and it never really, it doesn't really go anywhere. And then like, there's a moment in this movie where I, I won't say it goes off the rails because clearly it works for some people because people do like this movie. Yeah, there's just some but, people hold it in like the um, P.T. Anderson canon. Yeah, well, the end of this movie, I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, this movie, the climax of this movie involves a very literal rain of frogs falling from the sky which they justify in a way that is really just too clever by half. And when I say that, it's just like trying to be too clever. I should say <laughs> it, it, when, when it happened, I like the And I was, I literally like out loud. I said, Oh fuck you. Like that. that it's just not, I don't know. Hmm. There, there is some good stuff in it. Honestly, for yeah. a lot of it, I was just kind of bored uh, yeah. I will say this, Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie just plays like a regular guy just yeah. trying to do a good thing and God bless that man. Like he, mm. he oh, no. he's incredible. Even just playing such a, such an unremarkable role, he makes it into such a remarkable thing well, and it, it, it's, it's great. Well, I mean, well, he's great. Well, Tyler, I must say like, I like the life aquatic and like, I kind of like yeah. these like. The, the, this is the kind of thing that like would be something like oh let's have Mr. Slavnik try and unearth a gem <laughs> I, and like I minus a three hours bitch May, but... maybe you would like it I don't know honestly there's a lot of just it's so so strange Great job. And, the life and, aquatic is only two hours <laughs> and uh and Tom Cruise well yeah well two hours for Wes Anderson is like a three hour well, yeah, epic yeah pretty so, much yeah. yeah and and Tom Cruise in this movie you know I love Tom Cruise yeah I really oh, you do Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I really don't know what he's doing in this movie. He got an Oscar nomination for this, so good for him. Yeah. I, I, don't, I just don't know. I can't, I can't quite say I share all your love, but well, see, the, when the man's on, he's on. Yeah, oh, for sure. So that's Magnolia. I just I just don't know. And then, uh, let's see, I finally watched Looper. Uh, uh, let's put it this way, because like, I don't I don't want this to turn into like, a two-hour bloated sure, epic sure, sure, again. Sure. Can we blame Last Jedi on Ryan Johnson? <laughs> Uh, you can blame more of it on him than I had previously thought. Okay. Oh. There is some really stupid stuff in Looper. <laughs> and, like, for so much of it, I was just kind of like, okay, like, that's fine. Like, I, I really wanted to like it. And, and mm -hmm. there is cool stuff in it. And the way it deals with time travel is actually, like, it's, pretty it cool. It intriguing. But it is kind of intriguing. And there's, like I say, there is cool stuff in it. The What it builds to, God, I, is really just not... <laughs> 
it does not live up to <laughs> what they like. The, the first, like, bits of it write a lot of checks that it just doesn't even yeah. bother to cash. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, who was Looper made for? What studio was um, that? What studio? God, what was it? I just watched this movie and I can't remember. Um, <laughs> well, not, not many people are like, oh, I must track what studio made this picture uh, so I can judge it against the Disney curve God, like I, I do. I can't. Uh, I'm gonna look this up because it's gonna drive me crazy. Um, yeah, because it's. I just kind of want to think. Like, I, I'm curious. Like, oh, okay. It was released by TriStar. TriStar, a dying what? studio. Well, um, so basically, so Sony. Sony. Um, okay. Yeah, and and it is interesting because this is like this was like an original script with like mm-hmm. a heady heady central concept, and it was made for like kind of faux Nolan almost. Yeah, almost, and it was made for like a decent amount of money, and it looks. Yeah, it got. It, it yeah, it got a lot of it got a lot of promotional material. It did, and um, oh, I, well, I will say this: the I have nothing but love for Ryan Johnson's cinematographer, who yeah. apparently he's worked with since his film school days. Hmm. Uh, this movie does look great. Uh, okay. So uh, everything aside, uh, it's pretty good as a visual creation. I just mm. I was I was somewhat let down. So maybe yeah. maybe we can play more of the Last Jedi on Ryan Johnson. Than yeah, well, like, it still sounds something I'd be interested in because like. I like train wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a train wreck. Yeah, uh, it's it's odd. It, it's it sounds like the sort of thing like were we to do it for the podcast, we would talk about it for a really long time. That is certainly possible. There, there's a lot to dig at okay. there in terms of what goes right and what goes wrong. Anyway, uh, let's see. I watched Powell and Pressburger's A Canterbury Tale. Oh, I haven't seen A Canterbury Tale. Uh, delightful. It's it's, it's good. It's them in a in their kind of like lower key mode. Uh, so but, I assume black and white. Uh, yes, black and white. <laughs> um, it's a weird thing. It, like the, it it concerns these uh, three central characters who uh, get kind of stuck in this like English countryside town on their way to Canterbury, hmm. and they have to solve this. Very odd, like, mystery involving a man who runs around at night sticking glue in women's hair. He's the glue man. (laughs) They refer to him as such. That's rather strange, but they they sell it. They make it work. And then the movie does build to a kind of final uh, sequence that is really beautiful and transcendent yeah, this, and classic this, Powell and Pressburger. This, ca- this kind of sounds like a purely British version of 49th Parallel. Um, I can't speak to that because I still haven't seen 49th Parallel. Well, that movie's but... about, like, like Nazi U-boat crew treks across Canada okay. trying to, like, escape. Interesting. Okay, well, yeah, it's, it's a fun movie. There's a lot of very fun and interesting stuff in it, and the characters, as always, are just super well drawn yeah uh it's i would put it on about the level with like say a matter of life and death it's Ooh. it's it's not one of their like top of the pantheon efforts but certainly worth checking out though, though granted i also think a matter of life and death is one of the most fascinating movies i've ever seen oh so. I, that's that's an excellent movie yeah. i i just i don't know I, it, for me yeah. somehow it worked a little bit less well okay. than it did for you but still love it uh mm-hmm. anyway I watched a lesser-known Martin Scorsese picture called Bringing Out the Dead with Nicolas Cage. I have not seen this. It's a weird kind of cousin to After Hours in a lot of ways. Mm. Takes place, like, mostly at night in a very grimy, like, early 90s. Well, the movie was made in 99, but it makes a point of stating at the beginning that it takes place in the early 90s uh, um there's actually in fact a title card that says this movie takes place in new york city in the early 90s yeah um, well like, one of the most fascinating things about like scorsese and cinema is like the depiction is it just is completely stripped down and grimy depictions yeah. of new york well it, i think they make a point of that because so you're aware that like i think it's meant to take place kind of at the tail end of that era of New York City, yeah, like on the be- heels of the crack epidemic, before and all like that. before like before, Giuliani, yeah, and before all they the cleaned clean it all up, and then yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, this is a very grimy movie. It was written by um, Paul Schrader, who did Taxi Driver. Mm. Stars Nicolas Cage as a sleep deprived paramedic who want just wants nothing more than a break from <laughs> from from life, basically. The, the movie concerns uh, him basically on a few different nights driving around uh, trying to save patients. Um, hmm. it, it starts with him picking up this old man who seems to have died but actually goes into a coma. So they take him to the hospital. His daughter is played by Patricia Arquette. And kind of that becomes a running like through line that kind of the, the string that holds the movie together is 
like her dad kind of drifting in and out of life, basically. <laughs> All the while, Nicolas Cage is driving around, maybe going insane, being paired with different partners. He's with John Goodman for one night. He's with an incredible Ving Rhames for one night. Ving Rhames plays this character who is like super energetic and kind of a weird religious nut. There's this incredible scene where they go to a goth nightclub to uh, someone there is overdosed on heroin and uh, Ving Rhames does this routine where he gets the other nightclub denizens to like join hands to get, pray for Jesus to bring the man back to life even though he's not dead. He's pretending that... It, it's great. Uh, anyway... This movie is not uh, perfect. I, I described it as a cousin to After Hours, but it is no After Hours. Uh, it's I have to say, like you are saying a lot of things, and well, I'm hearing them as like perfect. There, perfect, there, perfect, there is perfect. a lot of there's a, there's a lot of great great stuff yeah. in this movie. There there are a couple of notable problems. Uh, mm -hmm. One is that kind of the central like relationship of the movie is Nicolas Cage and Patricia Arquette, and yeah. whenever they have a scene together, the movie kind of grinds to a halt. Mm. Like, their whole interaction is, like, kind of the same beats over and over again for a while. Like, oh, your father's... You should go home. You're, we don't know if your father's gonna make it. Oh, I hate... I kind of hate my father, but now I feel bad because he's dying. And also, then, it turns into this thing where, like, she is a recovering heroin addict, and mm. that kind of turns into a weird thing. It, it's not as bad as like, oh, he's going to save her, but that does mm -hmm. drag it down a little bit. And then there's this other thing where Nicolas Cage is like haunted by uh, the ghosts of the people he did not say, he could not save. I, I say ghosts, but it's really just one, like this oh. homeless, uh, like young woman who mm -hmm. he didn't, was not able to save. And her like face keeps like showing up on people that he just sees through the window of the ambulance. <laughs> That he's driving around. Like, seriously, it is, like, the one unquestionably iffy artistic choice. The, the one, like, cliched part of Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. Like, writ large, basically. And they just, like, they never really justify, like, why it's this one person mm. who seems to be haunting him. And also, it's the rare Scorsese movie where, like, the voiceover really doesn't add much. Like, the, the voiceover in this is really kind of corny and, like, doesn't work super well. But mm. I, I, but there is a lot of really cool stuff in it, and it looks incredible. Uh, the, the, the look of it is really very odd, actually. Uh, it's shot in CinemaScope, which is actually kind of a rarity for Scorsese. So it's interesting what he chooses, which movies he chooses to shoot in that format. Okay. And also just the lighting of it. It's got this weird, like even though this movie was made in 99, like it seems to presage the like early 2000s or like the mid 2000s look of like, do you know what I'm talking about? Like kind of the like harsh light, like mixed with contrast. I don't know. I'm struggling to describe it. If I'm sure. Like punch drunk love maybe? Not exactly. Not like that. I'm, I'm struggling to describe it. If I showed here, you. Here, let me like, let me pull up like a still. Yeah. If, 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 you, if you saw an image of it, that might help. I, I, I don't know. I'm kind of. Calling stumbling across it here but bringing out the dead oh, bring, oh thank you but I, I still think it's a really interesting movie and really kind of a a strange thing even even for scorsese i think hmm. it's definitely worth checking out and it's not one that people talk about a lot so i i definitely think it's worth a watch if you if you haven't seen it looking at just a yeah you're right there's yeah, kind of like you, a, you know what i'm talking about like that weird like the, like ever, like faces are blown out but the right background's ex exactly kind of darkened. yeah 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 i get it. like pt anderson sometimes falls into that trap and yeah. and honestly kind of, and the, the departed also has that look. the departed kind of has that too yeah um yeah the, the departed's a bit brighter than most of his stuff yeah but that's pretty interesting yeah day. i might i i might rush to go out and see that yeah, that's you should, yeah i think you might really enjoy it um and then i saw joe wright's Darkest Hour, which was fascinating, but not in a good way. Well, well I assume, like, I, the moment you say that, I assume that, like... Well, it's <laughs> interesting, because yeah. on, on, one, on the one hand, this movie is, like, one of the most aggressively mediocre things I've ever seen. Like, it, the, the, this movie is so... Like, you know how we talk about with, like, Spielberg's historical movies, like, sometimes they are, like, barely movies. Yeah. But Spielberg somehow has a unique skill for, like, making it yeah. feel like a he movie. He has such a cinematic style right. and such a kinetic verb yeah. that, like, it's, these things work. It's as if someone, like, took something that he would do that way... But they do not have the skill required <laughs> to make it well, into a real movie. Joe is I, not, and never will be, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> uh, sure, even though I haven't seen any other Joe Wright movies, so I can't really speak to that. But uh, from, what, um, from what little I've seen, he's got, a, he's got a unique visual style, at least. I do want to see Atonement. I, I hear that movie mm. is, is interesting. Uh, but, 
Yeah, I don't know, man. It, the, the, the plot of this movie, is, I swear to God, is basically uh, how Winston Churchill oratoried his administration into being okay with World War II. It's very oh, strange, okay. but 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 the really we- but the but the weird thing about it is that number one, the, the visual style. Okay, well, all this is all going to have to do with kind of visual and filmmaking things that he mm-hmm. does, uh, which is which is perfect for him, right? The, the the visuals of it, like there are shots. I swear to God, there is a shot in this movie that you could airdrop into a Wes Anderson movie and it would not be, like, out of place. Like, I swear to God, it is exactly a Wes Anderson, like, 90-degree whip pan. And so, honestly, like, moments like that are, like, d- suffused throughout the mu- the movie. It's so odd. Like, the visuals of it are, like, a mashup of, like... It was shot by um, Bruno Delbanel, who shot Inside Lewin Davis and mm. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. So it has that you know, kind of washed out look that works yeah. when you're doing like the Harry Potter and the half blood prince thing of like, they d- have the washed out thing, but then they like s- saturate the frame with like one color. Yeah. I but, think like, it also must be noted that like inside Lou and Davis is my least favorite Coen brother movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, just because of the visuals or well, like, not just, well, the well visual, I don't like the visuals, but like, that's okay, okay. But, like, well, uh, and then, but with inside Lou and Davis, I think that, I think that is done with a purpose of like the, it yeah. fits the mood of the movie and the like kind of the mm-hmm. the mood of the character. And yeah, but I also think that becomes grading grading in another way. But, yeah, but uh, back I back mean, to Darkest no, Hour. That, that's Darkest that's Hour. your opinion, and yeah. I we can agree to disagree on that. Darkest oh, yeah. Hour just has that the, the worst kind of like just washed out digital yeah. look, like where it's it all just like they'll have like moments of dynamic lighting, but mm-hmm. so much of it just looks really flat. And yeah, well, well, it, there's some shots of this, like in the trailers, you go like, this isn't black and white, but the only colors I can register with my eyes right. are black no, and white. No, like the scene of him speaking in the House of Commons, it's like lit with like a single source thing yeah, like coming down from the so ceiling. Yeah, it is so strange. So bizarre. And then... That's not, but, but that's not even the fucking like lighting scheme of the House of Commons. Well, it Joe Wright doesn't movie. fucking care. <laughs> Maybe it was in 1940. I don't know. I wasn't there. But uh, but then... It, well, it also got shit. destroyed during the war, yeah. so... And his researcher was probably a sack of shit. But yeah. regardless. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. But then, like, that's mashed up with, like, a, several, like, weird Wes Anderson-style shots. And, and then, good lord. There are s- several moments in this movie that are so bizarre. Like, they are these weird, like, eccentric, like... Shots and like they're cool, sure, but like they're just stuck, like smack in the middle of this like mediocre Oscar bait Churchill biopic, and you're like, huh? Why did he do it that way? Like, I swear maybe that's him like rebelling against like the Oscar baitiness of it. Maybe, but they just stick out like sore thumbs, and it it ends up just being like neither fully one nor the other. So you're just kind of like, what the fuck is this movie? Where like there's a shot where. It, like, does a God's eye, like, shot of, like, the French countryside, like, being yeah. bombed. And and then it pans across that. And then it turns into a dead guy, a, an extreme close-up on, like, a dead guy's eye. And I'm like, what? Is that a match cut? Or is it no, just, like, it's just, just, no, like a, it just, no, it just pans across cut. it. And, no, it's not even a smash cut. It just pans across it. And the landscape turns into this guy's face. What? What? I don't know. It's in the movie. Um, so yeah, and then oh. Gary Oldman, I guess, is good <laughs> in the movie. Like, he actually, like, you know, with the makeup job helps. And he actually, I think, does a pretty good job. Like, he okay. embodies the character. I'm sure he'll get nominated for an Oscar. I mean, like, to be said, like, all the trailers, he he looks and talks nothing like Churchill. But I, don't, <laughs> I think I can forgive that. Yeah, but it, it, it works as a character, okay. I think. And it, that's all fine. Uh, these, these things don't have to be impressions. Yeah, I, I agree. Like Michael Fassbender, like looks nothing like Steve Jobs, and no, he did a that works fine job as Jobs. I think. Anyway, that's Darkest Hour. I, I wouldn't say it's a worthless experience, but like no one the, needs to see the, this, this movie. This sounds like the kind of like technical train wreck I might have fun picking apart. It's so I never bizarre. see it in theater. It's but. so bizarre. Like I honestly don't know. Like how this happened, <laughs> I, I, I'm quite perplexed. You are almost like selling me on it as like some like ironic sort of like ad- analysis. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've talked long enough. That's what yeah. I've been watching. Okay, my list is shorter, but it's, 
But, like, there's still a lot of things I have to talk about. First of all, and I kind of want to talk about this, because, like, we flirted around with it. Uh-huh. But we haven't really had an in-depth discussion of it. The Polar Express. I <laughs> saw bits and pieces of it. What do you think? So, I think... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's sort of a train wreck. Uh, okay, okay. So, okay, train wreck. Okay, okay, that's a starting point. So, really, like, sort of, like, I saw this movie in, like, bits and pieces, and, like, the first bit I saw was, like, maybe, like, a third of the way through, maybe. Well, like, oh no, we're going off the rails oh, okay. onto well, ice. Well, let me just. This movie is so much weirder than you might entail. Like, <laughs> oh, there's yeah. an ent- yes. there's an entire section of this movie which is like somebody loses their big stupid golden ticket for the Polar <laughs> Express, and then the movie turns into like some weird oneer. Rube Goldberg device where like we follow <laughs> the ticket as it goes through wolves and mountains and waterfalls and is yeah. spit out by a bird well, just, and then all comes back to the train. <laughs> you have to rem- you have to remember this movie was released in IMAX and it, was designed and, and it, to be and it's, it's 3D something of an IMAX 3D extravaganza. Yeah. 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 And, like, there's also, like, honestly, I think that the whole thing can be described as a Rube Goldberg device. Because it's, like, the, the thing's triggered not by, like, character beats. So, like, they are in there. Right. But it's triggered by moments of, like, oh, no, the pin's gone from the train uh, <laughs> throttle. Oh, no, there are caribou on the track. Oh, no, there's a fucking ice pond where tracks used to be. But, you know... I kind of love it. (laughs) It is such like a strange, surreal, abstract, but also just kind of beautiful, like Rube Goldberg device. Like, because I remember like before this movie came out, I was really excited about it because like I had the book. Right. Because like the book's right up my fucking alley because I love trains and so forth. They get like the abstract, like the abstract surreality of a fucking train that goes to North Pole. <laughs> and they really play with that. There's like this right. giant musical number where Tom Hanks gives everyone hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and like, there's like, let me go, there's also like the weird hobo who was like, maybe oh, real, maybe a ghost. And like, it's just Tom Hanks um, hamming it up. Definitely a ghost. Definitely yes. a ghost. Well, like it's all, it, it, well, the way he's visualized, he's just so weird yeah, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. But, like, there is something just so dreamlike about uh-huh. it. And just uh-huh. and it's also, like, driven in emotion in a really interesting yeah. way. Especially when they get to the North Pole. And, like, there is a point in this movie where it's, like, after they've gone for the big Rube Goldberg device of them going through the North Pole. And, like, seeing, like, the giant, like, projection screens of all the children <laughs> worldwide. Right. And an elf in an admiral's hat and a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> which is wonderful. So I, many of the elves have Brooklyn accents. They have Brooklyn accent. <laughs> Come on, trust us. <laughs> it's in good hands. It's in good hands. And like, I, just to be said, like I've said this before to y'all, but I adore the the North Pole in this. Yeah, it's like some like giant like turn of the century factory. Yeah, and like the scale but also of it is has a like Tomorrowland esque like tube system. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. There's like something like <laughs> oddly like yeah, something oddly like steampunk, diesel punk about <laughs> it and there's just a fucking train that runs in the middle of it right. and it's it's so surreal and I love it. But like yeah. there's a point in this movie where it's like it's like them in the square and it's like Santa Claus coming to the sleigh which is like this grandiose mode of like it's almost like a state visit like Santa Claus <laughs> is the head of state of the North Pole right. and it's like trumpet sound and people are cheering and it's, it's not all- quite the cult of personality they oh yeah oh yeah they it's literally a- sing you Santa Claus is coming to town to, or to town to you better w- not right. cry right and then they burst open the doors. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it's most of a shot through, like, his first-person perspective. Well, that's one thing I love about that is, like, yeah. they have that whole thing where Santa comes out and, like, the main character can't see him mm. until he decides to believe in Santa yeah, Claus. Yeah, there's also something, but he can't hear the bell. Right, and exactly. So and all of that's, like, shot so, like, weird and dreamlike. Yeah. And I, I think maybe that's, I like, think- the one... I think it's it's easy to say like oh the book was never this like bizarre and Rube Goldberg in 3D well, and like sure but but the, like the book is like 30 pages yeah, long the book is, but I think it captures like that just sheer like abstractness of it that sort of like mm. wonderful surreality of it and sort yeah. of like driven by emotion driven by like what you want to see mm. as a visual as yeah. like a character beat more than like coherent like three act yeah. structure no, I... and, and I think it's really unique for that. No, I've, I've 
always kind of liked this movie. Yeah. And you can debate to what extent the, like, animation style was a good idea. Yeah. But I, I mean, like, sometimes it honestly looks kind of really compelling. Other times it's like, oh, that's weird. Yeah, yeah, But beyond that, like, there's some really audacious oh, yeah. animated filmmaking going on in this. And, like, you can tell, like, hey, it's Robert Zemeckis doing all, like, the, all, like, kind of animated wonders and camera right. woofing about. <laughs> yeah. And that's... Kind of great to see. Yeah, I, I would imagine if I were to actually like sit down and fully rewatch this movie, which I don't think I've done in a long time, yeah. I might actually really enjoy it. But why, yeah. why do you say it's a train wreck? Reed? I mean, like I get where you're well, coming from because it's just so strange. And like, I mean, if you try to analyze this on like a like plot point to plot point basis, you'd be like, "What the fuck is this movie about? What am I watching? Oh, now they're on a river. Like, what the fuck? A bird just spit out a ticket. What?" I was just referring to that one scene that I just walked in and, oh, train on ice. It's <laughs> off the rails. Train. Just like this movie's animation. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of like that. <laughs> I do really enjoy that sequence, though. Yeah, where it's just like, it's like this weird, it's an action scene of a train on ice, and right. it's just this weird, Tonics and yelling out, like, commands to the character. <laughs> right! Okay, Tom Hanks is wonderfully hamming it up in every <laughs> scene he's in. And he even gets to play Santa Claus. He gets so to play Santa Claus. I, he, he does that. a terrible Santa Claus, but it's oh. like, but, it, but, it's, but it's really charming, and he's putting a lot of heart into it, so... I think this movie strangely holds up. Okay. I even kind of like Monster House, so I am by no means against the Robert Zemeckis. I I haven't seen... Monster House, the more I, like, look into it... The more I'm like, would I like this? Because I remember oh, like, you I've seen it. I've seen it, but it's been a while. Okay. I, I, I've just been like, what? Is, what would well, this I, be like? I, I just I, haven't. I, had, I just haven't had a chance. I haven't, I haven't watched it in years, uh, yeah. but I, I just remember enjoying it. I remember thinking it was much better than it probably had. Any right maybe to be. the Zemeckis. Maybe we can do like Monster House and like Beowulf as like <laughs> our like Zemeckis oh, experiment episode. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. That's Polar okay. Express. Um, what else? Do I, uh, let's let's go to something animated because I think we're gonna have a lot. To, uh, I, we'll see what happens when we get the three billboards. But okay. Coco. Yes. Okay. Hit Reed, me. Reed. No, no. I want to start. With, Reed, what do you think of Coco? I thought it was. It's okay. Yeah. It, it's really good for my. So like, I have a seven-year-old cousin, and like for her, the, the mm-hmm. this would be like a perfect movie. Oh, okay, let's talk about. But for like anyone older, including well. Us, it's just okay because we can see a lot more. Um. Well, okay. Let's start about this. Like, this is a movie about like a boy with like this like militant shoemaking (laughs) family that despises music, and like because like there's like an ancestor who's like whose husband just fucking left, Mm -hmm. which is like something is like wow, this is a kid's movie. Yeah, he just fucking leaves. Where he goes off to make music. Oh, well, absentee parents are all over kids' movies. Well, like, this yeah. is just a case, like, this is what you begin the movie on. Sure, sure, and it's sure. And it's just, like, and most of the time it's like, oh, the father, like, he's just not here anymore. Uh-huh. This is, like, he left, yeah. and this is about the mother left behind. Mm-hmm. And, like, and she started making shoes and started this entire, like, matriarchy of, like, yeah. shoemakers, kind of, like, passed down generation, right. the generation. I, I and that say, family is fascinating. I gotta say, all that, like, introduction stuff where they're, like, telling the history of the family, like, pretty much right away I was on board with the movie. I'm just yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I was too. Like, great job. Like, the family is just really fun and funny and kinetic and just wonderful to watch. Miguel is... A kid. Yeah. Yeah. He's a Pixar Disney kid. And that's fine, <laughs> I guess. Sure, yeah. But, like, I'm also, I'll get back, I'm, I'm going to put a pin in that for now, because, like, let's get to this, because, like, this movie's depiction of the Day of the Dead and, like, the Land of the Dead is uh-huh. gorgeous. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Some of the finest oh, yeah. Pixar's ever done. Like, I adore the Land of the Dead. I adore, like, the little town they're in. Mm-hmm. And, like, there's just, like, some, like, incredible animation in this. And just some incredible backdrops and yeah. location work and lighting. And it's just utterly wonderful to watch. So, like, when, like, Miguel goes to the Land of the Dead and, like, some, like, weird scene where, like, he tries to steal a guitar. Because he wants to be, he wants to be a musician. Right. But the shoemaking family won't let him. Yeah. And, and, like, you get to, like, he's in Land of the Dead. And he starts meeting his ancestors. Right. And they're yeah. also, like, and they're a little, like, matriarchy of their own. Because yeah. that's still been retained as, even though they're dead. Uh-huh. And, like, in theory, the movie should be, like, 
like, any character would, or like any human would be like, holy shit, my ancestors are in front of me. Religion is real. Holy fuck, holy <laughs> fuck. I believe you. I'm going to make shoes for the rest of my goddamn life. And like, it would like become something about like Miguel learning like to admire the family and like why the family is the way it is. Sure. Yeah. But then the movie just presses the caper button. <laughs> it's from there. I think it's okay. There are some great jokes yeah. every once in a while. There's some great animation here and there. But like, I think like once it hits caper mode, I think the movie just kind of hits like a, not so much mediocre because there's still a lot of great humor and great yeah. writing and that sort of thing. But it it is just it, I just get the sense like man, this could have been like way more interesting than that. Yeah. Is. It's like going on cruise control in a 35 mile per hour zone. I mean, sure, that's fine. Yeah. But ideally, you wouldn't do that. Yeah. P- yeah. P- Pixar seems to have been kind of hitting this wall lately where like... Mm-hmm. I, 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 think the, I think this is actually a little bit worse than Inside Out. As far I as would as agree with yeah. that. Like, yeah. I mean, all, all their all their movies that aren't sequels now like seem to be having this problem where like... Mm-hmm. We've seen Pixar's move so many times now yeah. that, like, we're kind of starting to be disappointed that they're not, like, pushing... They're not as... revolutionizing animation right. of every movie. They're, they're, not, they're not pushing as hard... Or they're, they're not seeming to be pushing as hard as they used to. Because, I mean, back when they first started, like, their whole, like... <laughs> mode of storytelling was something really new and really cool. Toy and... Story is almost experimental as far as kids' films are concerned. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, well, yeah, and they were doing all kinds of crazy shit like Wally and Ratatouille and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And even though I think if you break down the structure of, like, most of their movies, even the great, great yeah, movies... Yeah, you, you can like, find, like, Caper you can Button find here. that, yeah. but... You know, I think now that we've seen that so many times, I feel like we're starting to get tired yeah. of it. I, I think I'm just kind of disappointed because, like, in theory, Pixar should have, like, a blank check, and they should right. be just, like... They you, sh- you would think they, if anyone had would have carte blanche to do whatever yeah. they want, it would be Pixar. In, in theory, like, they should be, like, our, like, American Studio Ghibli, uh-huh. where they're just, like, constantly doing, like, these, like, Which grandiose, it seemed like they almost experimental were at that yeah, point yeah. in the mid-2000s. Yeah, but then just, like, wasn't there, like, a major leadership change or, like, something, like, well, they were bought? Or... I, well, because Disney bought them and John Laster uh, went to oversee Disney animation. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure, like, I don't know to what extent. But, like, I mean, Disney's in Burbank and Pixar's in the Bay Area. Yeah. So, uh, clearly, you know, he can't be everywhere. No, no. And, I mean, I have a theory, I'm sure many people share this theory, that, like, once John Lasseter started to pay more attention to Disney, Disney got a whole lot better and Pixar got a whole lot worse. Yeah. And I I would be intrigued to know, like, kind of the the behind-the-scenes stuff of all that. Like, I'm kind of waiting for someone to write the oral history of Pixar. Yeah. And And maybe this is just, like, maybe the issue with, like... Pixar being like this committee of this mm-hmm. committee brain trust, Disney will never have a Hayao Miyazaki. Sure, that can never happen within like the Disney format. And I'm right. curious, like whether or not like that. I granted, you could argue that that singular vision actually hurts Studio Ghibli in a certain regard. Uh huh. But like that kind of like authorial, let's push boundaries, let's do something new, just can't persist. Yeah. In this kind of like film, and and I I'm just, I I can only assume that like Pixar gets only like the finest animators and the finest storytellers mm-hmm. in the media. But I guess like there's maybe you just cannot get that that like push that drive right. without like a singular vision. I don't know. That, that's that's like my own side, like bullshit off the cusp, <laughs> like uh, theory at yeah. this point. Because like I because like because I think like the Studio Ghibli comparison is valid. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I, I Pixar is some is something that I just am so invested in because it defines mm-hmm. so much of how I look at movies and yeah, how I just look at how just about and, just about anyone our age is going to yeah. like look up to them as they as we move so, forward. Yeah, I'm going to continue to follow like what they do with extreme interest, and it'll be interesting to see if they can ever reach those heights again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I certainly, I liked this movie, I think, more than you guys did. That sounds, that sounds about yeah, right. But I mean, certainly I think it seems like we all enjoyed it. I, I'm just, I'm just yeah. kind of, I'm lightly disappointed. Yeah, okay. That's, that's sure. about where I'm at. Like, I, yeah. I, 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 I admire what is there, but I wanted more. Okay. Which I, I mean, and I, and I think with Pixar, I'm allowed to want that's more. That's certainly fair. I mean, I walked in knowing absolutely nothing about this yeah. movie. And then, so like, for me to walk out feeling, well, I kind of saw it. 
you know, I kind of saw the ending a quarter of the way through the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, but there's I was also still entertained by some stuff, so I yeah. guess that's fine. <laughs> well, well, seeing what's going to happen in a kids' movie as like as like a 21 year old is just kind of something that's going to happen. Yeah. So I can't really <laughs> criticize it for that, even if you are Pixar. Uh, like, like I said, I think my kind of thoughts on the movie, like uh, this is like Pixar doing Disney and doing it like pretty well. I think yeah. this is a, like an, an above yeah. average kind of Disney movie. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine, but I, yeah. I I think we know that Pixar has the potential for more than that. Yeah, I I, mean, I, I guess like my final thing is that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, next movie I want to talk about is uh, Three Billboards. Three Billboards and, outside Ebby, Missouri. Oh, good God! I still have Christmas story to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Filmed in. Carolina. <laughs> no, Carolina. Hey, man, the South just all looks the same. Yeah. Like you, you, we, uh, you. Have you been in the South? Yeah. You, it all looks the same. It's all shitty. Except like, I mean, Missouri looks like the West a little bit. Kind of looks a little like the West. I don't or give a like fuck. The, or, or, or like the South Midwest. What do you mean you don't give a fuck? Uh, but uh, let's. This is a movie about Francis Mc, Francis McDormand. Her uh, daughter got raped and killed. Yeah. And she is on a crusade to get the person who did it. Yep, and, yep. like, as part of her crusade, she puts, she buys, like, three billboards that aren't getting used and puts up, like, these really audacious, like, mm-hmm. messages on there directly pointing out the police department. And what ensues is a comedy of errors with the police <laughs> department, with just the local population, with me- with the media, right. with, like, people in her own personal life. It's kind of a more of a document of this town than really a document of Frances McDormand, even though she is kind of like a central yeah. figure yeah. Right. in this. And it's fascinating, and I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's great. It, it's great. Frances McDormand. If she doesn't get like an if she doesn't get an Oscar for this, I'm going to be chucking things at a wall. <laughs> She's incredible. I, I yeah, this movie's great. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yep. And yep, you know, this was the second time I'd seen it. I will say it was it. Um, like, the shock value of it was diminished a little bit, but that's just natural when you know what happens in the yeah, movie. Yeah, well, there's kind of, like, there's some scenes that kind of have a club-handedness about them. Like, I think that, like, I hope you get rape scene. It's just a bit too on the nose. Uh, that edges over a little yeah. bit. Although, and, uh, I do kind of appreciate that just for, like, showing mm-hmm. kind of how spiky family relationships yeah can get. i mean I, I also yeah. just kind of want I, i'm just so like wow the daughter is a real person not just some like ethereal right, thing that yeah. we like we pin the emotions of the movie on thank yeah, you that, thank that, you Mark, Mar- martin mcdonough that works pretty yes. well yeah so that's all good but yeah it's like that's a problem it's like we it, it, it's very difficult to have something to say about such an empirically great movie that like <laughs> that had that will have like lots some of people, journalism uh, there's being some pushback on this movie which i i guess i should read the criticism well, so i can official uh What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Ad- adequately respond to it. Yeah. Well, from what little you've read, is it more about like some of like the racial dynamic we've like been There's talking about? There's some stuff about, about the racial dynamics. Uh, I don't know. I have to read more of it. I don't really want to get into yeah. that right yeah. now. We have other stuff to talk about. Yeah. General hot take. I think it's more like I think it's more skewering of like southern racism than anything else. Sure. Yeah. And like I think this is one of the great depictions of a southern town. Mm-hmm. But like I, uh, you're right. I'll read the reviews. I'll, I'll, I'll come back with more with something more concise. But Three billboards, great. Yes. Good score, too. Yeah, yeah, good score. The great uh, Carter, Carter Burwell with mm. his magic. But um, one of the, I, I, I wanted to talk about this because, like, this is just one of these, like, in the canon classics. I'm going to talk about Christmas Story. Yeah. Segue okay. so far. This is one of the most, this is like, in the canon classics, It's it, it plays 24 hours a day <laughs> on Christmas and it, it is just something that, like, me and, like, my family worship. Like, we sure. watch it every year. And, like, it, it's kind of a strange thing to watch it. Because, like, each generation of my family gets about the same thing out of it. Uh-huh. Which I think is, like, so peculiar. And I think that's a great thing in its favor. But, like, what do y'all think of it? Uh, a Christmas Story, I, I've i always really liked it. I mm. mean, I first saw it when I was maybe, like, 10 or 11 or some something like that. And I, I ever since then, I've really enjoyed it. it yeah. It's a perennial favorite. I don't sit down and rewatch it every year. It's one of those ones where, like, on Christmas, you'll just kind of have it on in the background. Yeah, it's kind of on in the background. It's playing continuously. I'd argue that's the best place for to have, like, your Christmas memories sure, set sure. up against it. I think it's really, it's really good. It's it's a super charming, like, movie mm-hmm. that has a great edge to it. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. all this stuff. A really interesting edge, too. Yeah, like, all the stuff with, like, his relationship with his dad and... 
like the lamp and just so many so many, this is obviously a, a movie of vignettes and so many of them are so well constructed i think and, i think the narration is wonderful oh it's great oh, yeah. the the only thing that could get me away from the soft glow of electric sex was <laughs> little orphan annie <laughs> oh yeah yeah no that's all that's all great stuff and you know something you know that obviously i didn't really think about when i was younger but uh, now i i can kind of pick up on this Oddly, like, subversively nostalgic, this movie. Yeah. Like, it's, it's shot with, like, a lot of, like, weird kind of soft focus. It's kind, it's kind, and, it's kind of sepia like, and kind of, like, faded. Yeah, like... And it, that's intensified all, when there's, like, a dream sequence. Right. It's all shot kind of like a flashback in a weird way. Mm-hmm. And, and like, you know, it's this guy's, like, kind of idyllic, not, but not so idyllic, like, rem- yeah. rem- reminiscence of his childhood. And, uh, you know, that's all good stuff. And, you know, I think it's interesting the way they portray you know, that, and the way he, he recalls all this stuff. Yeah, well, well, one of the things about the movie is that, like, you have this dichotomy of, like, nostalgic musings, like, they, I, I think it's, I think it's very interesting that, like, when you hear about how the, ta- how it was shot, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, this was shot, like, in Cleveland, this was shot sure. in, like, Indiana, that was shot in Toronto, it's kind of, like, vaguely Midwestern, mm-hmm. if you can never yeah. quite nail it down, <laughs> which is something interesting. I think there's also something to be said, like, there's, like, you also get, like, them, like, peering into the department stores, and it's, right. like, very, like, oh, I want, I want, I asked for this for Christmas, and these are my, like, happy Christmas memories, but, like, it's also just very honest about the child experience, like, the oh, kids yeah. act like kids, they're, like, they can be selfish, they can be, like, muling, they can, like, they crafts, they, they, they can, they, yes. they, they, they can say swear. fuck, yes. <laughs> and there's also, like, like, the, the bit, like, where he's got the bar of soap in his mouth, right. and, like, the, the scene where, like, oh my god, is my father going to whip out the belt and beat me? And, like, that whole sequence is fascinating because that is a oh, scene... Well, there's, there's literally a scene where his brother is crying and hiding under the sink yeah. and he's like, Dad is gonna, gonna kill, kill Ralphie! <laughs> and, like, but that's preceded by a fascinating scene where, like, the big, like, bully character gets the shit kicked out yeah. of him. Oh, and like and like that is like shot with like no sort of that is yeah. like without style, just there you deal with it, uh-huh. and it ends with him crying, right? And like yeah. being hugged by mother, and like going up and getting cleaned up, and it, it is it is a really honest depiction of childhood in a really strange but yet nostalgic way. Yeah, and I absolutely adore it. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I love it too. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, that no, no is, debate there. <laughs> good, good, and that is what I've been watching, or at least, considering we're almost an hour in now, what I'm allowed to talk about. <laughs> Reed, do you have anything to add? Um, I watched Coco and Three Billboards. Okay. So, that means... No. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's not a bad list. Let's get into it here. Uh, do we want to start with uh, Blast of Silence? Let's start with Blast of Silence. Okay. Okay. Ooh, you took notes. I took um, notes for once. Uh, Ooh, okay. that's more than I do. All right, so this and was it shows. Uh, this movie was made in like 1960, released in 1961. Yeah, uh, kind I, of. I think it was released like 1962, even though it's maybe early 60s. Uh, yeah, somewhere, somewhere, weird, somewhere in there on on the very very tail end of the classical noir. Era. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is like I think one could like recall. I think, mean, especially many people consider, like, a Touch of Evil, like, one of the mm. last noirs, and that was, like, four years earlier. Almost. Right. Uh, this movie was made on, a, like, a super low budget, mm. uh, starring and directed by, God, what's his name? Uh, Alan, Alan... Alan Barron, I think. Alan Barron. Mm. Alan Barron, yeah. Uh, playing... This is, I believe, his first film. I think so, first, yeah. First, Interesting. First, first Apparently, he, he was, he went on to have a very uh, long and... I assume prosperous career uh, directing episodes of television. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I uh, think he did all right. Yeah, <laughs> but he had a he had a few movies that he did, and I think this is kind of the best known. Yeah, yeah. Just made uh, for very little money in New it, York. It's, it's City. held together by grit, spit, and gumption. Yeah, pretty yes. much. And um, yes, he's playing Frankie Bono, a contract hitman yeah. uh, arriving from Cleveland, arriving in Manhattan to take care of a job. Baby Frankie Bono. Yes, and, uh, okay, yeah, and then the narration in this movie, good God, I love it so oh, much. Oh, it's, it's so it, 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 it sounds like it's been, like, it's being filtered to, like, someone in, like, a smoke-filled bar by, like, yeah. an ancient man who just has <laughs> stories and stories to tell. Well, it, it feels... I thought it was Orson Welles at first, but I'm like, 
No, it's not. No, no. It, no. It, 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 this is. It, it just sounds like gruff, like floor of New York musings, yeah. and it almost feels like hey. this is maybe like his inner monologue, like constantly taunting him. Yeah, like yeah. there's an episode of BoJack Horseman in in season four where it, it focuses on like BoJack's depression, mm-hmm. and like you hear his like internal voice talking to him throughout the episode, and that's oddly kind of what this yeah, reminds yeah. me it, of. It's yeah. kind of like, this is a guy that like seeks to like isolate himself from the world yeah yet is also just kind of desperate for just for some form of interaction yeah, yeah. like there's like there's like a fascinating scene where he goes to like the one woman that unfolds and there's just a desperation uh-huh. about him that's really interesting to watch oh, yes. yeah. yeah i will say i think you know this movie is a pretty like straight ahead like s- standard kind of noir setup where yeah, the, the yeah. guy like comes to the city to you know do a killing and he kind of doesn't want to do it and he's mm-hmm. he, uh there's a woman and all this stuff and he him, him kind of struggling to recapture his humanity yeah uh i didn't like love this movie i think it's I thought it's an all right it's an all right noir yeah i, I mean for 77 minutes this is pretty solid this, this is, is fairly pretty, solid. There's, there's a lot of interesting things at play. There's yeah. also a lot of like low budget charm. Yeah. I, 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 one yeah. interesting thing about it is that like I, I think it's I think it's uh, fitting that like one of like the big noirs is like the big heat, which like mm-hmm. we have no idea where that takes, right. even though we've seen it. Yeah, and this is specifically New oh, York. Yes, yes, New yes. York. You arrive in Penn Station. Uh-huh. You walk past Rockefeller. <laughs> you're, like you're walking past Brownstones, and he says like I hate Harlem. Yeah, and, like all that. This is. A specific location, which yeah. is something, which is obviously something you don't always get from a noir. And, right. and honestly, the studio system kind of strives to kind of separate itself. Yeah, well, because they're trying like, to sell the movie to, like, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. so often, especially now, we, like, we end, but even still in, like, the classical noirs, you get just kind of a ambiguous, like, mm-hmm. monochrome big city kind of feel it's from it. It's a small town. Where is it? I don't know. Middle of fucking Kansas. I don't sure, know. yeah. And, um... Yeah, so that specificity, yeah, I agree, is interesting. And mm-hmm. I was just going to say, like, I do think, like, the pleasures of this movie come in in kind of the the frippery and the window dressing. Yeah, it's like, it. it's it's the narration. Yes. It's, it's like, how they shoot in New York. It's yeah. like, it's, this movie is dripping with, like, a noirish atmosphere. Yeah. It is also kind of, like, I brought this up to you, and I'm curious, like, what you, I, I kind of brought this up, I'm curious what you think of it now, now that you have some time to take sit on it it's kind mm. of french new wavy it is in a certain is. way it, it, a, a little bit I, yeah. I, it kind of reminds me of like how good like, especially the ending kind of reminds you of goddardish yeah where it's, it's like it's like is the movie like p- pulling my leg like mm. is well this comes out around right about the same time that like breathless and 400 yeah yeah this is like this is co-current out. yeah 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 it has all that and yeah it it, it, it almost feels like it's like playing Maybe not playing with, like, gangster mm-hmm. tropes to the extent that someone like Godard yeah, was. There, but... there is a sense of, like, we know you've seen this before. Yes, yes, and we are sure. And we are trying to show you a different lens. I, I think yeah. I think that comes through most clearly in the narration, which is, yeah. like, joking and, like, You're right. kind of, like, internal monologue and also kind of, like, somebody, like, telling you. Right, but also, like, interpretation. maybe this movie's idea of God in a weird way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's all interesting stuff. And, and Frankie's relationship with the woman whose name I cannot remember. I can't either. Um, nope. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Film, film critics, we swear. Right. Uh, th- their whole thing, like, where he basically, like, borderline assaults her, and mm-hmm. she, like, kind of, sort of forgives him, but yeah, it's for kind, it, but is, also... Uh, is, is obviously shaken. Yeah, those, those scenes are very... They are definitely sore thumbs in this overall piece. Mainly because, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. sort of, like, how it's shot is awkward, and, like... And I guess it's supposed to convey a sense of awkwardness between Frankie and this woman, mm-hmm, but sure. then this dialogue is just <laughs> not great. Well, um, yeah. it's interesting. I, I do it's... think the the way they handle like the whole that whole thing is kind of like less dated than you would think. I think there they, is they, a bluntness about they, it. There's yes. a bluntness, and yeah. they handle it with a surprising amount of like sensitivity and like uh, mm-hmm. you know clear eyed. It, it doesn't just shrug and move on, right? Which, exactly. Right. Which is they, what a but, lot of Hollywood yeah, movies do yeah. from around this time. Yeah, and also just like what '60s media was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the other thing I think is that like. Yeah, it's kind of stilted, but that is by design. I mean, this right, guy yeah, is yeah. out of place wherever he yeah, goes. Yeah, he he yeah. is like, like I said, there's like there's like a desperation to that scene, and like, and I think that distance of the camera represents sort of like the dis- 
the distance of the character. <laughs> there, there's an earlier scene um, when uh, Frank is invited to this uh, Christmas party by his orphan friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm going to call him. And the bongos in that scene. <laughs> yeah, and this was, like, part of the weirdest part. And I did, like, a whole thing of notes about this. So, like, Are like, we getting in the musical, the the musical theory here? No, just, like, comparing, like, bongos. Sort of, like, the, like, the... The musical atmosphere and like how how like bongos and like the Christmas music like sort of go back and forth and like sort of see like how Frank just doesn't mix well with the party mm -hmm. and then like yeah. after that peanut fucking whatever race thing. <laughs> yeah, there, there's also sense that like when like he meets the like friend from the orphanage like the narration takes over right. in like a really interesting way yeah. where like usually like uh -oh. class. Classic, signal. Cl <laughs> classic noir was just a dialogue scene and maybe they try to make it feel awkward but this is just a moment like the narration takes over and like we get like externalizations of like what what he is thinking yeah in like a really interesting way so yeah i i would say uh there's there's a lot of interesting stuff in this movie I, i'd agree as a whole it, it doesn't quite you know cohere totally it's, but yeah it, it it's it's no masterpiece uh, yeah it's no masterpiece, no masterpiece. but it, it's interesting and i'd say it's worth checking out and it's interesting mm -hmm. because like i think this movie kind of I don't know how much attention it got at the time, but it was like one of probably the early... Probably not much. Probably not much, but it was probably like one of the early examples of like the New York independent scene. Yeah, That yeah. like John Cassavetes would kind of pioneer mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. Oh, certainly. So I, that, it's an interesting document of that. Like, it's got a lot of filmmaking flair to it. It's kind of like proto-Scorsese-ness yeah. about it at certain Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think actually, bit, yeah. I think Scorsese was in film school at this time and yeah. I, I, rem I think I, I remember reading that he like saw this movie and it actually kind of influenced him a little bit yeah well I think I, I heard I, I don't know if this was like Paul Schrader but I think Paul Schrader said like this was the inspiration for uh, Taxi Driver and so oh interesting okay. oh. I, 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 granted it's been a while since I've read that so like don't take my word on that uh -huh. but yeah I, I believe that there's some there's certainly something quite ta Taxi Driver-esque about yeah, it yeah yeah for, for sure yeah so yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of proto like all these interesting classic movies. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of take that as you will. But it's it's worth going back to the source to to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. Degree. I, I think like if yeah. you like are want to see a noir from a different angle mm -hmm. or like or, or kind of want to see like man like I I wish like if they I wish they kind of made a French new wave uh, new wave movie from like an American lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, it's not bad. This yeah. is kind of what you yeah. get. This yeah. if you're looking like pre like Bonnie and Clyde New Hollywood kind of stuff. This is. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good example of that. Yeah. Uh, Reed, yeah. do you have anything else in your, uh, uh, your notes there? I have some more things. A lot, a lot more things okay. than Ooh. usual, because I took notes. Uh, you have done work. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Actual work. Maybe um, I should have taken notes, considering I watched this movie like a week ago. Uh, 87 episodes in, finally did some fucking work. Yeah. Okay, so I think one thing I put is that... Um, no fucking way Frankie's from Ohio with that accent. <laughs> no fucking way. Um, true. <laughs> yeah. No fucking way. There, There's this really interesting scene where, oh, Ralphie. It's like Ralphie. Oh, we didn't even talk about Ralphie. Troiano, oh, shit, yeah. Where like Ralphie, Troiano, and family, and then Frankie are all in the same bar. And then like there's this weird bongo man <laughs> that like Fun. plays music. The bongo's like, really stuck with you in this movie. <laughs> it, it, it's like what the. Fuck? Oh, oh yeah, that's like a strange, fuck? strange, really interesting scene. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Hence, I think that's why we didn't talk about it. <laughs> there's a lot of. There seems like there's like a rising amount of tension in, in, in that scene, which is great. But then I think I wrote this like word for word. Fuck that bongo man. <laughs> okay, Reed, Reed is on the record as not liking your bongos, Blast of Silence. <laughs> the hot take of the century. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Alan... Barron. Alan... Fuck, yeah. Alan Barron's apparently still alive. Oh. As far as the internet knows. Okay. Hmm. So, which is... Has he made anything inter uh, recently? or is uh, he, has he since the 80s. I think I read that he's a painter now. <laughs> Sounds right. Maybe. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And then one last thing, um, I literally put this as, like, ending sync, mainly because he's just shot, and he just 
Falls and face first. Well, yeah, well, that, that yeah. ending is, I it's think... Somewhere I, in Long Island. I think that's the most, like, French New Wavy part of it. Just, like, this, like, what should be climatic is, like, sh- is, like shot to be undercut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just, like, it just... Fu- he dies, and it just fucking ends. C'est, c'est la ville, why do, why do they kill him again? I can't even remember. I don't fuck frankly. it. I don't fuck it. it it's all yeah. about... Point of, point of it's like life in the wind. Yeah, uh, yeah. What what does it matter? So, like, that was the part of wrestling the almost because like you had this voice go saying, "Oh, he's going back to the darkness. <laughs> you'll you'll be alone soon." And then like there's like this thing with like Frankie wanting to like you know have a connection, and then we get this like internal, mm-hmm. external, we don't know type of feud, and then it just it, yeah, but it, it also just, tries it, to it undercut satis- that. It's just not satisfying. Well, yeah, I well, well granted, like I, I'm on the record, I don't like most of the French New Wave, so like <laughs> I'm, I can kind of take her, take her, yeah. leave this this ending as like as far as the cinematic experience is concerned. Yeah, I, I just kind of, I just kind of like what it might, what it signifies. Is that all? And then probably one thing we already said is that that, that like second person voice thing. Oh, the narration or yeah. Oh yeah, well the narration's fascinating and lovely. And the most fascinating than most of the dialogue. <laughs> more, much, much more fascinating than most of the dialogue. Well, they kind of blew yeah. their load of the narration. Well, <laughs> I must say. Yeah, well, they, well, yeah. Well, once you, th- that's the first thing you hear in the movie, and I think kind of coming off of that, it's hard to match up to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blast of Silence, not perfect by any means, but it's, it's an interesting watch. Worth checking yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, alrighty then. So let's move on then to Stanley Kubrick's final film. 1999's Eyes, Eyes Wide, Wide Shut. Shut. Yes. Or Eyes Sexually Forced Shut, as sure. I like to call it. Okay. That's Whatever. not going to be the title of this episode. Mm. Or maybe it will be. Who um, knows? No. Uh, Damn it! Damn it! <laughs> but, g- good try. But anyway, oh, okay. yes. Yeah, so, uh, this movie uh, begins with Nicole Kidman's ass, just so you know exactly what kind of movie you're yep. watching. Um, yeah. And, uh, well... What did you think of this movie, John? <laughs> okay, here let me, I'm going to front load this first because I kind of described like this is based off a novel written in the 20s uh-huh. by an Austrian writer uh, Schinster, who uh, wrote uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, more preferred uh, like novellas, uh, Lieutenant Gustil, about like Austro-Hungarian military culture. Oh, this is the same author. This is the same author, oh. and I think it says a lot that like this is from a 1920s novel written by an aging Austrian Jew. Ah. I think that's how you view this for. That's where its depiction of marriage comes from. That's where its depiction of sex comes from. Kind of like all the kind of like behind closed doors, prim and proper, let's not talk about sex, let's not talk about breakups, Catholics don't get divorced, (laughs) that sort of thing. But we smoke weed. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But we smoke weed. weed. Which is one of the, which like, in 1999, this was dated. Maybe. But I don't hold it against it that much to mm. a point I, because that's what no. the source material said set up to be. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So, anyway, the setup of this movie, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman play yeah. a high society New York married couple. One's uh, like a Tom very Cru- well-paid doctor. Yes, Tom Cruise is a doctor. Uh, anyway, so uh, they kind of uh, seem to be experiencing the beginnings of tension in their marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nicole Kidman basically confesses that she uh, very seriously considered an affair yeah. uh, at some point, and which sends Tom Cruise out into the night to ponder and grapple yeah. with his idea of what his marriage is and sends him on a dark night of the soul journey into... Yeah, he has crazy... flashbacks of oh. Nicole Kidman getting oh. fucked by somebody else. Uh, yes. And uh, sends him on a crazy spiraling journey... Uh, which becomes more and more uh, twisted and weird and complicated mm-hmm. as he ventures down the rabbit hole which leads to into the a- sex cult. Yes. Sex cult. The, <laughs> which, yes. which, which isn't uh, in the movie as much as you might believe. Well, that's kind of what everyone talks about yeah, when they talk yeah. about this movie. Yeah. But yeah, like that's like a... It's the like, iconic image. It's yeah. a like 10, 15, 20 minute sequence. Maybe, yeah. In the, sandwiched in the middle of this yeah. movie. Mm. They kind of like the specter of it is yeah. what like underlies the rest um, of it. This movie... I really did kind of like it. I, I actually, I, re- I enjoyed watching it quite a bit. I really like the first half. Uh-huh. I really like the two-hander between Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and them just kind of exploring the difficulties in their marriage and the difficulties uh-huh. in their love life and, like, the specter of affair. And, like, I, I think it's fascinating when Tom Cruise, like, om- almost sleeps with a prostitute <laughs> yeah. and, like, that whole, right. like, dark night of the soul moment i think post sex cult den uh-huh 
where it's just about what it, it becomes kind of like Tom Cruise trying like to pick up the pieces of what the fuck actually happened that night almost. Right. Yeah. And I well, think I, I don't think that's anywhere near as interesting, as, especially because I think there if you were making something about like sex and marriage and relationships, mm-hmm. you need more Nicole Kidman. Sure. You need that voice. Right. And I think that's I think it's a tragedy that, that she's not in it as much as she should be. Uh, I, I I don't know if I agree with you. Okay. But that's because like I was sort of like watching the first half, sort of because yeah, a lot of these are much interesting and like looking back, and this is probably where a lot of the more interesting sort of like intellectual work comes through. Mm-hmm. But it's like, uh, <laughs> please, Kubrick. Please, <laughs> like, like, I'm done. I, Move on. I, I I think Kubrick kind of hits the Fassbender wall in this um, at a certain point. He seems point. to hit it very fast. I, I don't think that. Uh, Tyler, what do you think? Well, um, I do agree with you that like Nicole Kidman should be in this movie more, especially yeah. because she actually I think gives a really interesting performance. Oh yeah, and, and like oh, yeah. And her perspective is fascinating. And you know, much as I love Tom Cruise, and I think he's done very good work, and I think he's really trying in this, and mm-hmm. I do yeah. think the siltedness is by design. Yeah, there's always kind, there's always some kind of, of like surreality about yeah, Kubrickian and performance. That's the Kubrickian yeah. mode. Um, I will say I'm not sure Tom Cruise was the right man for the job. Mm. I, I think. Probably Kubrick was kind of trying to capitalize on the star power of, like, their marriage, because they were a married couple yeah, at this yeah, time. And yeah. I think he kind of wanted that, to bring that element, that kind of metatextual mm-hmm. element like to that, it. Oh, it's real, it's right. marriage. Yeah. Which is interesting. Oh, yeah. Watched now, years after the fact, I think that effect is definitely lessened, and you're yeah. kind of like... Okay, Nicole Kidman's great. Tom Cruise, like, I love the guy. I'm not sure he was the right choice for this. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. Like, there's some scenes you're like, oh, that's an interesting performance, but he kind of just looks lost yeah. most of the time, oh, and, and not yeah. and not and oh. not really in like and not even so much like in a thematic way of mm-hmm. like, oh, he's searching for like things. Right. He generally looks like I don't know how to react to this. Yeah. I'm like action hero Tom Cruise. What the fuck is this? <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know, I still did enjoy the second half of the movie. I, okay. Maybe it's not as thematically interesting, but mm-hmm. I kind of like this whole, like, Tom Cruise's, like, downward spiral of, like, I want to know, but I'm never gonna know, so, like, all I can do is just be kind of wonder about what this mm-hmm. all means for me and for my life. Yeah. Uh, which maybe I'm making sound like that's more of an element than it actually is. Yeah, but, I, I, yeah. I, I, sounds right. I, I'm just I'm just kind of struggling as to like what the, like post sex then this movie's really about. Uh huh. Kind of the repercussions of what happened in the beginning, but like I'm also just kind of well, curious like 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 what yeah. Kubrick has to say about that. Right. Well, it's interesting. You get to that scene, which I think is really a great scene with him and Sidney Pollack at the end there, mm-hmm. where they're talking about like what happened and what happened to this girl and yeah. like all that yeah. stuff, and you're kind of like. Is he telling the truth? Does it even matter if he's telling the truth? Like, yes. I, I, I don't know. And uh, that's all interesting. And I think that gets at something about, like, playing with, like, the nature of reality and how one experiences things. And mm-hmm. and, and that's Memory and stuff. truth yeah. and lies and all that. But the movie yeah. doesn't really probe that as deeply as it could. No, it, it's kind of just should. something that comes up and we move on and we kind of become about Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman again. Uh-huh. Sort of. The, the, I think, like, the ending of it is fascinating. Like, Tom Cruise, like, sees the masks, mask on a bed and just goes like, all right, I'll tell you fucking everything. <laughs> I'm gonna break down to you. And, and all that. And then there's, like, this, like, the really tension-heavy scene of them walking through a toy store. <laughs> Right, right. It's just and so it strange and, and surreal, ends. like so great yeah. With the with, with the famous lines, there's something we need to do as soon as possible. What? Fuck. <laughs> Kept to black. Kept to black. Um. Yeah. Well. Okay. So it's interesting. Like with Kubrick's movies, a lot of them, I think you can kind of boil them down to like one like key like idea that he. <laughs> probes and explores and like carries to like a full weird like potential i, I don't think i don't think I you think, can quite do that with 2001 but i think like maybe not cl- 2001 clockwork like orange one, full metal jacket you can do yeah. yeah yeah like, like you know like right. um and maybe that's oversimplifying the movie but i think like as a star you can reduce it to a starting point yes like paths of glory is like 
war and war justice war and all that stuff. Yeah. Like Doctor Strange Love is his nuclear war movie. Mm-hmm. Full Metal Jackets is Vietnam War movie. Uh, uh, the Shining is like cabin fever. Yes. Um, yeah. And this movie is sex, obviously. It's sex, and yes. It's weird, like, the sexual content in this movie, I would say, and, and, you know, I struggle a lot and I go back and forth on, like, you know, thinking, like, we should be more like the Europeans and not be so hung up about this stuff. Yeah, and also, yeah. as an American, uh, I have been educated in a way where this stuff still makes me uncomfortable. So, yeah, well, like, I, and honestly, like, mm-hmm. in this movie, I think I would describe it as excessive. Well, like, here's, I, I, actually, I actually don't disagree with, like, we're gonna, sh- we're gonna show you an entire room of an orgy, and yeah. we're gonna show you a sex yeah. den where we get nipples and things like that. My, my issue with it is, is in, like, to where that is directed toward. Right. Because, like, yeah, in, in, like sex is a, is a is something done by like in most cases two people. Yes, but then, in most <laughs> cases, but, uh, not, but almost maybe not in this case. Mm-hmm. But like it it is something in, that is something engaged in it in all genders and uh-huh. all perspectives. Yeah. Yet the perspective we get from this movie is overwhelmingly male. Yeah. Tom yeah. Cruise is the uh, lens for which we see this world. Uh-huh. A, a sort of male gaze pervades this entire movie right yeah. from from the very first shot of the movie when from, we see just a medium shot of nicole kidman mm-hmm. undressing <laughs> and like yeah. for, and like and honestly like i for all like the sex we see i think the most problematic part of it all is that like we are just not getting a, another perspective of sex uh-huh. than a like straight male perspective sure yeah. which i think is just something you're going to get when you're adapting a book from the 1920s <laughs> yeah no i oops. I definitely agree. It's questionable to what degree Kubrick is subverting that. And I think really, less than we might think. Yeah, and it also really doesn't help that most of the female characters in this movie are, like, not well drawn at all. No. Like, no. Nicole Kidman I, is, like, the one. And at yeah. worst, they are objects. And it, that woman, like, when he goes over to, like, comfort, like, the, the woman mm-hmm. whose father has just died, yeah. and she's like, I love you. And he's like, uh, what? What and the fuck is this? That's, right, that's another, like, Tom Cruise, like, what am I doing? And, oh, and you're, yeah. you're kind of like, okay, why? Yeah. <laughs> why like, was this in the movie? What are you getting at, Q? Especially, especially just kind of dropped. Yeah, and, like, and, and, it doesn't and, really play into anything else. Especially considering, like, we already have, like, later on the, like, Tom Cruise thinking about cheating on his wife and uh-huh. almost cheating on his wife. Yeah. Right. So that's just even stranger in context. Right, why do we need two scenes of that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Two very long, drawn-out scenes of that, as, yeah. as Kubrick is wont to do. Yes. I mean, but I don't know. I, It's weird. Like, for as, like, slow-paced and drawn-out as this movie is, I yeah. still... I, I still think that it, it was a... I, I was consistently entertained. Like, I, I, I was never really I was, bored. I, I wasn't... Uh, yeah, there's some parts in the second half where I'm just like, oh, good. Is Tom Cruise going to go to another place and uh. not know what the fuck he's doing? <laughs> Gee, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. But there's a certain money got to that, but, like, the, the first half of it, I was, like, glued to it. I, I just... Mm-hmm. I love the sets. I love, like, the, the imagery. Yeah. I love the ideas. And, like, the sex stand is just like, what the fuck am I going to see here? Even, right. even as, like, pervasive in pop culture as it oddly is... You have no fucking clue what you're going to expect right. when you yeah. get to that sex den. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Reed, what, what do you have to say? Yeah. So, I like the, like, the beginning, like, 15 minutes of this. and then The kind of, like, ballroom. Like, and then, like, it kept going. It's like, <sighs> okay, these are good ideas. I see what you're yeah. doing, but please, next scene. Next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I, which I, which, which is not an isolated thing with Kubrick. I like, oh, yeah. I, I think, I think, I think 2001 suffers from that a lot. Mm-hmm. We're just like single idea. Okay, what's next? Right. Well, what's next? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, the thing that helps, and I texted this to you. Mm-hmm. When you were talking about this, like the, the yeah, this the, is a story about character, right? The thing that helps yeah. with this is yeah, there's a you're focused on a character and his goals and his mm-hmm. pursuits for like pretty much the entire runtime of this movie. Yes. Yeah. 2001 is mainly about like just watching things happen what yeah like and, like like th- objects right. and masses like a, and, a, see, a, and procedure is a great way a, to put it like yeah. yeah watching procedures like a, a seven minute scene of a spaceship like docking at a space station yeah and that's literally the only thing that happens right um uh-huh. so that's all strange um yeah yeah 
so like especially with like you know Bill, he's the yes. Tom Cruise, yep, bland vanilla white well, male character. Well, I don't think he's quite that. He's a uh, I think vanilla white male is true, but I wouldn't quite call him bland per mm. se. Okay, well I guess I, there's some interesting things, but not. But, like, sort of, like, the seeds of the movie really start out with that weird, like, Sandor character that only shows up once and talks with Nicole Kidman about, like, cheating on one's, like, spouse. Like, sort of, like, those, like, thematic oh, yeah, scenes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sort of, like, are, are, are planted. But it's not until, like, 55 minutes in for which, like, he starts his, like, Dark Knight of Horrors and Sex. Yeah, and yeah. That, like, it really gets going. His, his after hours journey. His yeah. after hours yes. journey, yes. And, yes. And that's what I really liked a, a lot. And I did like how this, like, this, this prick piano player, Nick, is actually somewhat useful in this movie, maybe, mm-hmm. I guess. There's, I, I don't know, he's but, kind of, he doesn't really seem to have a value outside of like gatekeeper of the sex den and like, yeah. and like intrigue and so forth. Right. The password is Fidelio. I think it must be said like this movie is extremely theatrical and full right. like Kubrickian yeah. fashion. Yeah. So like I knew that the so like going into this movie, the only thing I really expected was the sex cult, and then I'm like. When am I going to reach the sex cult? <laughs> this is sort of why I paid money to see this movie. Man, there's nothing that weird in the sex cult. No, I, <laughs> I mean, have to yeah. say. <laughs> it was, it, it's like, it's oh. It's nothing you wouldn't see in softcore porn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just like, oh, yeah. Oh, it's an orgy. Oh, yeah. That's kind of where it's like, there, oh, like oh, the, okay. there, there is something very. I, I think it's. I think it's very fitting that Stanley Kubrick tried to make this in the '60s because there is something mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's. I think it's very dated in that sort of like, ooh, sex, ooh, yeah, in that sort yeah. of way. And I, I think that's kind of how I feel about it in regards. It is just something. This is was released after he died. Mm. I, I don't know. I, I how old was he when he was making this? Um, he I'm was. Not sure. This was his last year of life. Yeah, he, well, yeah. He, well I know I know he died, like, but I don't know what it, what age he was. Well, what what happened was he literally he screened his final cut for the studio, and then he died like four days later. Yeah, yeah. And then yes. the movie the movie didn't come out for like another few months. But mm-hmm. he was. I don't like doing math. Um, <laughs> well, what's the? Uh, he here? was he was seventy. When he seventy. Died. Seventy. Okay, so this is this is an old man adapting. Well, no, he was seventy. 70. Okay. This is an old man adapting. A, I, 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 want, I keep I, I keep wanting to go back to the twenties because that's where it feels like these like sexual and like mar- uh, marriage related uh, notions come from. Uh-huh. And also, that sex den looks very much like it was designed in the twenties. Yeah, it, 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 it'll tell you. Like, Redress it a bit, and it's a great Gatsby set. Um, but regardless, it, it, it's an old man <laughs> make, adapting a book he want he wanted to start adapting in the sixties. But like had the clout to do whatever the fuck he wanted, uh-huh. and like as much as like we can we we can admire and adore Kubrick, and like there's a lot of room for that, especially in this room. Sure, this is just kind of a product of that. Yeah, and like I can some of it's fascinating, but I think it's mostly dated. Perhaps I, I don't yeah. think it's mostly dated because it's weird. Just because I mean, it, sex you know permeates our culture even more so mm-hmm. now. I yeah. don't really remember culture as it was in the 90s i think it was yeah a little bit more restrained and it, it's odd no matter how much like we talk mm-hmm. about sex it still seems like in american culture sex is kind of this weird yeah thing where well, it, well we are just so like tight-lipped about it like right, I, exactly. I, I think i think that, i think it's just so telling that like how uncomfortable like the me too movement has just made this country uh-huh. as a collective sure. and and so you know all that in light of all that i do think that this movie maybe isn't Certainly it's dated in a lot of respects, but mm-hmm. I still think there is something to the way it treats sex mm-hmm. and sexuality uh, that yeah. plays into American culture uh, in a weird way. And I would actually agree with that, because like I said, like I view it through the lens of it's an, it's an adaptation of a 1920s book mm-hmm. made by an old filmmaker, and like I can admire it for that. Um, and I think it's interesting for that, and I kind of love it's like New, New York vis-a-vis Vienna. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, Reed, what else do you have? Um... Just a lot of like momentary points of things that like what what <laughs> and they're really too much 
for us to go through. So well, that's Kubrick for you. There's going to be just sometimes just something weird yeah. happens and you have nothing to say about. Well, it. Well, I, I was, yeah. you know, I I kind of thought this was maybe his most bizarre movie. Then I remembered, oh yeah, The Shining. <laughs> so oh yeah, yeah pig oh, blowjobs. Yeah. Okay, right. yeah. With that weird dog and the butler blowing each other. That's. I don't know. <laughs> I, well, you asked me, like, oh, does this classical music of the Soviet era have any symbolism? I said, like, Kubrick likes classical music. <laughs> this is just, I, I was really outside, disappointed. outside I was of the. I expecting a cum shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, but I'm sorry. I, 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 I think Kubrick is. Actually, no, I think. I, I, I don't, I don't want to condemn Kubrick in, in any of this. I, I, I think he is more human than we make him out to be. For, for sure. Well, I think. You know, he was married to the same woman all his life. Yeah. By all accounts, he was a very loving husband and father. Oh, so, I'm sure. Uh, in spite of how he may have treated people on set. And <laughs> his record with uh, actresses is maybe it's... not the best. But I, uh, I mean, I think it is like a well, universal thing that Ku that we think Stanley Kubrick is a terrible person. Well, sure. But, you know, he, he was a human being. And, yeah. You know. And his perspective was fascinating. As, as it, I think it is here. I think some of this movie is utterly fascinating and completely unique. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yes. I do have a point. So so I kind of drew one connection from another 90s movie. Uh, Tyler, do you remember Far and Away? Yeah. Yeah. That um, movie's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, oh, what is this? You know, um, Ron Howard's Far and Away, also starring Nicole Cruz. Uh, Nicole Cruz. Nicole <laughs> Kidman and Tom Cruise. And also Who Wastes. Just like how um, Kubrick did, uh, Thomas Gibson also strange enough. Uh, huh. Yeah, they they play Irish immigrants coming to America in the like nineteenth century, I think. Yeah. And uh, that movie's not just not is good. It, is it something I like should have heard about? Or I don't know. Uh, Probably uh, not. Uh, okay. Well, I think it's one of its main distinctions was that it was one of the last major movies released in 70 millimeter uh, at the time. Oh. So, uh, there you go. Okay, mm. well, I, I don't care. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so you just said, um, like, A, it, it reminds me of this movie, moving on. <laughs> well, there's a, there is a scene in that movie where uh, Nicole Kidman peeks at Tom Cruise's cock. Do you remember that? That was five and a half years ago. <laughs> no, wait, that was four and a half years ago. Of course I don't. Yeah, there's a scene where like they he's naked for some reason, and the the <laughs> conservative buttoned up Irish mother puts a little wooden bowl over his cock, and uh, when everyone else leaves the room, Nicole Kidman takes a little peek. Uh, yeah, that movie's not good, That's as I've said. Movie. Yeah, I am speechless. I'm sorry. And then thanks for that, Ron Howard. Sorry, go on. All right, and then probably just one last thing, and then you and then you guys can close it out. That password guy at the gate is so nice. <laughs> so oh, nice. everyone's very courteous. They're, they're all the they're all very party. gentle, gentlemanly, and like floating on aristocratic uh, aristocratic traditions. It's a and sex cult. It's all, in the sex, it's a very civil sex cult. Are, Thank you very there much. There are there are rules. Yeah. <laughs> to the sex cult. Can we talk about the ending with with how like this like guy they were like oh. He's just a backdrop at a party, but then he actually like plays this huge role slash leads this sex cult. This Ooh. like Ziggler guy. Oh, uh, Sidney Pollock. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if he's the leader. I don't think yeah. he's the like master of ceremonies guy. But okay. he, um, well, yes, apparently he was there. And a apparently, yeah. He, I, like, I, okay. I, I, I like that scene. I, I like that scene. I feel like it needed a little bit more, but I felt. Maybe it would have helped if he had, like, been more present in the movie, but... Yeah. Well, that, that scene just seems kind of like airdrop out of fucking it nowhere. It does, yeah, like the structure yeah, of the film. Yeah. It's not the most uh, imp impeccably yeah. structured film that yeah, There's, there's ever something made. oddly kind of like, uh, not, not, not chinsky insofar as the visuals are concerned. It's like mm. sumptuous and like... Yeah. Uh, was it shot on 70 millimeter? I don't think so, but you, a, you, get, you always get that like blue light coming through the window, that yeah. vibrant blue just... Yeah, vibrant blue light looks good, but there's something kind of chinsky in like how it's organized and how it's edited together. Mm. And like, maybe, maybe that's because he just fucking died. Well, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's something. And there is uh, some debate as to how actually complete he was. And Kubrick, uh, yes. Kubrick had a reputation for like editing up until the last minute. Yeah. And, but 
I think his daughter has said that like this was his preferred version. Uh, you know, mm. we, you can make of that whatever you will. But interesting, you know, they, this all goes into the AI debate. Sure, and so sure, forth. sure. But regardless of anything else we may say, this is a really interesting movie. And yeah, like if, if you have an interest in it, go see it. If you have yeah. an interest in Kubrick, go see it. Oh, for for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's it's an inc- it's a fascinating document of the mm-hmm. last stage of Kubrick's career, and you yeah, know yeah. That he was making so few movies and so far between at this yeah, point that yeah. everyone i'm sure was like an event like, oh, like, oh, and like uh, they, well you, was, see, you see the tagline it's cute isn't it yeah like, the the, like the, the billing is cruise kidman, kidman kubrick. kubrick yeah so yeah and you know this was 12 years after full metal jacket so yeah yeah it's interesting to look at it as a final statement from one of the all-time masters and it, it, uh, it's yeah. both stranger than you might expect uh, yet also exactly what you might expect yeah Maybe. I mean, like, this This took, like, what, 400 days of production? Yeah, yeah. this is, like, one of, like, the longest <laughs> it, shoots ever. Right. It looks like it. It <laughs> looks like it took 400 days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, that's uh, that's just Kubrick. Yeah, that's yeah. Kubrick. But there um, you go. I, 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 just as, like, a brief caveat, I, I, I think we should stop, like, praising Kubrick for doing so many fucking takes. Um, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> because at a certain point, you are just torturing your actors. Yeah. But, which, which, um, which now sort of gets me going. It's like, how many takes of that, like, initial, like, sex cult scene that they have to do? God only knows. God only knows. All right, that's Eyes Wide Shut, and uh, I think that closes the book on another one. So It's a movie. Uh, it yeah. exists. We thought it was fascinating. Good night. Kind there you of. go. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs> and uh, next time, uh, I had an idea for what we could do to Ooh. bring in the new year. Since, you know, I'm not sure what kind of opportunity we're going to have in the future, I think this would be a good time maybe to watch uh, some of Martin Scorsese's uh, big epic period pieces, perhaps. Well, like which ones? Well, I'm just kind of, and feel free to say no, but yeah. I, I really don't know when other, what other time I'm going to have an excuse to watch Gangs of New York. <gasps> I, <laughs> you know, I'd be on board for that. Okay, okay. I'd be on board for that, because, like, some people praise that movie, other people think it's a train wreck. So I have heard, some people say this movie is atrocious. And yeah. Actually, I, uh, my roommate watched it. He says, and, you know, I'm not sure how true this is, because I haven't seen the movie, yeah. but he says that, like, the first hour is incredible, and then after that, uh, it all kind of drops off. So yeah, I and this movie is two hours and forty five minutes long. So uh, you know, I I am on board for a potential train wreck from one of the all time masters. I mean, even if Scorsese, you know, even Scorsese's lesser work is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I I, what, I am as I proved this week with Bringing Out the Dead. Yeah, so. yeah, I am. I am on board for that. Okay, okay. Say, maybe I'll watch Bringing Out the Dead okay, as like a yeah. supplemental thing. Sure. And then uh, I'll, I'll probably have to watch Goodfellas. I still have not seen Oh well, yeah, you should uh, you should fucking watch Goodfellas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and then other than that, um, we could watch The Aviator. I've or... I've already seen The Aviator. Oh, you've seen The Aviator. But, but, okay, but that, but I, I think if you're if you're interested in doing that, I really I really like The Aviator. So. We don't we don't have to do that. It, uh, that's... Well, it's actually it's actually been a while. So I think it's actually been like it's only been it's almost probably been like three years. Mm. potentially since i've seen the aviator that's interesting okay well that that movie's also pretty long i mean all all of his period pieces tend to be um so anyway we could do the age of innocence that's another movie that Mm. he did with daniel day lewis actually criterion announced that he just that they're putting that out oh that'd be something i'd be interested in next year um we're saving less temptation of Christ uh, for our too much Christ <laughs> too episode. Much. <laughs> Let's see. We could do the Age of Innocence. We could do Kundun. <laughs> what? Um. Do you not know about Kundun? No. Uh, okay. That's a. Uh, I, I need to dive back into the Scorsese. That's what I'm finding out. That's a. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's another one of his big. It's based on the life and writings of Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama. Maybe we could just save that. I'm not sure how much I really want to watch that. Um, huh. Shutter Island. Uh, I've seen. I've seen Shutter Island. How is that? 
Like, imagine if you gave, like, a director carte blanche on a kind of standard sort of, like, thriller. But, like, that carte blanche becomes, like, a, it's, like, really fascinating filmmaker. But a kind of, like, pulpy uh, source material. Oh, okay. So it's it, it's interesting. I, re- I remember really liking it. Okay, that's interesting. Um, So, yeah, I think I would like to do either The Aviator or The Age of Innocence. Age of Innocence is shorter. It's still like two, two twenty. Let's but... let's do Age of Innocence. Okay, okay. I, I think I, the Aviator is something we might we could do like another time. Yeah. If we dive back into Scorsese at a later date. All right. Or so maybe should, like we need if... to get you in the fucking Goodfellas. Yeah. Or, or maybe like if we like somehow like be on an airplane, we're allowed to do like a podcast. <laughs> we should watch and record. We don't have the money to do this. I know. <laughs> That's, that's the Hack Fraud Show coming to you live from the sky. Let's, let's give it, let's give well, a that's big, interesting. Let's, but... give, let's give a big thanks to Delta for allowing us to do this. <laughs> oh, we wouldn't ask permission. Who are you kidding? Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, I all have right, sponsor them. I'm all right. Just a fan. So um, Martin Scorsese period pieces coming your way. <laughs> Gangs of New York and The Age of Innocence, both starring Daniel Day Lewis. So uh, this should be interesting. Interesting. I didn't think that we'd come to this, but hey, I'm glad we're here. All righty. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure we'll have a lot to dig into. Yeah. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining us. Have a wonderful holiday season, and uh, we'll see you next time. And you know, oh, fuck me sideways. No, I don't know. Fuck me sideways. Oh, we were waiting for John. Sorry, John. John turned on his TV by accident, and we... We don't want HBO showing a Batman v Superman to come back on. Blame it's, my it's bl- Blame my ass for that. Yeah. I will be smashing coffee mugs as well with baseball bats. Yeah. Well, we're already doing that for New Year's. <laughs> oh, are we? Apparently, that's the plan. Um, I didn't know about this. Oh, okay. Fun, fun. Okay. Well, well, it's almost a tradition at this point. But. Very true. Um, I, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Good. C- continue. I don't okay. think I've ever done notes. <laughs> No, good. Keep, oh keep yeah, going. Go, uh, like, if, do you, do you have list uh, uh, list for this? Uh huh. <laughs> okay, whip it out. Oh, it's already out. Oh, oh boy. Ooh. But I, but I do think sexual um, innuendo in an eyes wide shut review. Yay. <laughs> I don't want to know how they made it. <laughs> yeah. But um, I I think. It's like sausage, but yeah. Sorry. You don't want to know how sausage gets made. Yeah. It's. I mean, I don't fucking know how sausage gets made. It's All right, well, we're regardless. Anyway. <laughs> do, 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 do. Professionalism. Do, 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 do. We planned ahead. Oh, yes, we did. At least one of us did. Do you mind? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, who, me, or? Okay, anyway. Um, I don't know. No, yes, you. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, I went to go to his filmography, and I just went to his biographical page.